Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship here at Glendale Heights United Methodist Church on this glorious September morning. I greet those who are with us, uh, watching with us on uh, Facebook Live, and um, pray that you will feel connected with us even across the distance and uh, remind you to let us know that you're watching and feel free to enter any prayer requests in the, in the comments um, so we can address those later on in the service. And also there will be a link for electronic giving um, that'll be made available later in the service when we, we take up the offering. Um, I'd like to remind the members of the church council that we need to uh, meet very briefly right after service for one more little bit of charge conference business. Um, also, we have a number of new announcements in the bulletin, um, turn over on the back, and um, Sunday school's starting back. Um, we've scheduled a dinner at Homestead in December, your traditional Christmas dinner. Um, doesn't say a time, is that right after worship, Larry? gather at the restaurant at 5.30? Okay, so um, make a note on your calendar for December 18th to gather at the Homestead Restaurant at 5.30 in the evening. And we have an invitation from one of our preschool moms to um, a mindfulness workshop, and there's flyers out in the, in the Northex about that. And I would also uh, remind you all that this coming Tuesday at 7 is a webinar that I think will be of great interest to uh, a lot of y'all, those who enjoy gardening and keeping up your lawns. Um, this fellow, Doug Tallamy, will be uh, talking about um, beneficial ways to, um, to garden and to keep your lawn, uh, ways that would be <clears throat> helpful to the natural ecosystem. So I think it's going to be very interesting, a lot of fun, and very practical and um, an enjoyable way to uh, participate in, in caring for God's creation. Uh, any other announcements? I have a few, if you don't mind. <coughs> I'll take the mic for a second. Uh, my first apology is the organ has this button on it that I can dial, and it changes how much reverb is happening. Um, I can make it sound like Notre Dame Cathedral Wednesday night. It, on its own, made it sound like Notre Dame Cathedral, and I currently can't control it. This morning, it sounded like Glendale Heights, but if during the service you notice a lot of extra echo, it's not my choice. It's just what the organ is doing, and the man who fixes it lives in Fayetteville, and we're trying to figure out a time he can come. Uh, the early morning Sunday school class, we started that years ago uh, for people who had to be in choir and get things ready. We're going to start back up 945 on Sunday. We're watching Adam Hamilton's The Walk. There is a book that goes with it. Anybody who wants to join us is welcome. It's not a closed group. It's just an early group so that we can continue with choir. Uh, the choir will be robed next week. Uh, we all took our robes to be cleaned this week, um, unless the weather's 90 degrees, in which case we'll hold off on that. But now that we don't have masks in front of our faces, we'll put the robes on. It was too hot to have robes and masks um, and stoles and everything. Uh, and lastly, uh, the choir will be hosting a chili night, Saturday, October 22nd. We're gonna have chili and baked potato soup at our house, Ken and Amy's house. We'll have the address, directions, you're all welcome to come and enjoy just an evening of enjoying each other and socializing now that it's a little safer to do so. Thank you. Any other announcements? Well, we continue um, this month with our, our emphasis on, on celebrating God's creation, this uh, September season of creation. and and our place within it and our responsibilities to it. So I invite you now to take a deep breath, begin settling in 
clearing your hearts and minds of burdens and distractions and begin to enter into the stillness and center your hearts and minds on the God who offers grace and mercy and redemption in unlikely ways. you to please rise in body or in spirit for the call to worship. Those who love God, God will deliver. Those who know God by name, God will protect. Those who call out to God, God will answer. We gather this morning as those who trust God. To God, to God be all honor and praise. Let us pray. Redeeming God, you never turn away when your children seek you. As we gather this morning to worship you, grant that the presence and example of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit would transform us and draw us into more intimate relationship with you so that we may be your agents of transformation in the world. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us join our spirits and our voices in our opening hymn, number 140.
please be seated. <coughs> I hope most of y'all got the um, email about uh, Tommy Walters uh, being hospitalized. He uh, was experiencing stomach pains on Thursday night and was taken to Alamance Regional Hospital, but he left without his phone and so it was Friday night before he was able to get up with Pam and let her know that he had been hospitalized. So um, went over and checked on him yesterday and got his phone back to him and some other things he needed. And they're um, going to keep him a couple of nights at least while they um, treat his gallbladder and uh, those heart problems that he had mentioned to us before. So um, please keep Tommy in your prayers. And, uh, he actually seemed more worried about missing his family reunion today than he was about uh, being hospitalized. Um, but I, I know he was uh, trying to get in touch with, with his family and let them know what his situation was. And so um, we'll just hope that he's, yeah. He's, um, he's a trooper, for sure. And uh, Pam was saying that he did manage to get in touch with a family member and uh, let them know uh, that he was in the hospital. So hopefully they'll, they'll be showering him with some, some attention and, uh, and, and hopefully with their prayers as well. So we all surround Tommy with our love and care and we'll be helping him in the days ahead. Are there other joys or concerns that you lift up. Very sorry for your loss. Janae's asking for prayers for a uh, family of Steve Burgess, who has passed away after a long bout with throat cancer. Okay. Yes, sir. be to God. So two good news is there. Um, Tom Simmons has a new cousin, a little baby cousin, and um, Reed Babinick's brother's test came back negative, so he does not have cancer. So we give thanks to God for that mercy. And I'd like to ask for prayers for my little grandniece who is on her third antibiotic trying to cure an ear infection. She will be celebrating her first birthday this Friday. And, uh, I'll be going on Saturday to uh, her birthday celebration. If all goes according to plan. So I hope she <coughs> stays well, recovers, and is in good shape to, to celebrate. Yeah, she texted yesterday and said the wound looked a lot better. Yeah. So that was that was great news. So we do continue our prayers for Dee and her uh, arduous path towards healing of that knee. But it looks like um, she's about to get things under control. So we are grateful to God for for His healing for Dee. There are no other joys or concerns, then let's go to God in prayer. God of grace. 
grace and mercy. By your creative power, you have made a world that speaks to us of who you are and a world that perfectly provides us and all your creation with all that's needed to flourish in peaceful coexistence. We so often have failed to trust in your perfect provision and have mismanaged the gifts of your creation and mismanaged our relationships. Change our hearts, Lord, and open our eyes and ears to all that you're doing in our lives and in the world so that we may grow in our trust and in our love for you, and for our neighbors, and all your creation. And as the good news of the gospel proclaims the redemption of our weakness and brokenness in you, so we now claim that redemption for those persons and situations that we've mentioned today. In their sickness, make them whole. In their weakness, make them strong. In their suffering, give them comfort. In their grief, give them hope. In their fear, give them courage. And in their despair, uplift them. In their hunger and thirst for justice, satisfy them. Receive our prayers and pour out your strength and courage upon us so that we may boldly work for those things that we've prayed for. And we pray now as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
you guys are a hard act to follow, but uh, we will not be reading the Old Testament um, reading this morning, or I will not, um, but um, so please turn to your, in your hymnals till 834, we will read the responsive reading, um, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, God's glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down upon the heavens and the earth? God raises the poor from the dust and leave, lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of God's people. God gives the barren woman a home, making her a joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. The gospel lesson today is um, Luke 16, 1 through 13. the parable of the dishonest manager. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest with much. If then you who have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As Pam mentioned, today's scripture passage is known as the parable of the dishonest steward or the, the shrewd manager. And it's a complex and confusing parable. And the commentators are all over the map with it. It was very difficult to um, decide which, which interpretation to go with because uh, they're all different. Um, but it does seem in this parable as if Jesus is condoning honesty rather than condemning it. But we know that wherever Jesus is, there is also grace and redemption. So I invite you to join with me as we um, make our way through this difficult passage and try and listen for the grace and redemption that's in that, in that parable. So pray hard with me now. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
So this is a parable that has to be read in light of its time and place, and I am relying on Dr. Alice McKenzie of Perkins Seminary for her historical background on this. She tells us that there were complex relationships between landowners and managers and peasants and merchants during the time that this parable was written. And the landowners sought to get as much profit as possible from their land and from their tenants. And that much hasn't changed in 2,000 years. But the manager was the middleman between the landholder and the merchants and the tenants in the exchange of goods and services such as buying and selling grain and oil and crops and in collecting rent. So if the manager was able to get an additional profit for himself by inflating the prices and skimming off the increase for himself, the master didn't really mind as long as the manager was discreet about it. And the landowner himself would sometimes add an interest charge in violation of Torah law. But something goes wrong. The parable doesn't say exactly what, but the landowner calls the manager in on an accusation of mismanagement. And the manager is in a vulnerable position. He's in danger of losing his job, and he doesn't seem to think he'll be able to find other work. So he sets about trying to secure his future. He calls in the debtors, and he reduces their bill by the amount that he was skimming, and possibly also takes off the landowner's little extra interest charge as well. Now, as the parable points out, the manager was very shrewd in doing this. He was protecting himself in both directions. In reducing the debt, the manager earned the goodwill of the tenants in hopes that they would take care of him in case he couldn't find a job and support himself. And he also protects himself from retaliation by the master, by the, the landowner, who was, after all, violating Torah laws and couldn't really hold the, the manager too much to account. But in, in this whole thing, the manager earns the admiration of the landowner his master, who realized that the manager's actions made him look generous and benevolent. And so in the end, the manager keeps his job. So on the surface, the parable does seem to condone a shrewdness that seems dishonest and even manipulative. Dr. Richard Lisher tells us, uh, or calls it, the hardest parable because for one, the reader can't decide if the manager's behavior is positive or negative. And we're also puzzled by the master's approval of the shrewdly manipulative man manager. The master's approval, with the landowner's approval, makes sense, though, in light of the emphasis in Luke's gospel on mercy. And this emphasis on God's mercy and redeeming grace is especially apparent if we accept Lisher's interpretation of the parable as a mirror image of the parable of the prodigal son, in which both stories include a note of remarkable grace. The parable of the shrewd manager has the same plot as the prodigal son. It includes an unsympathetic figure trying to save his own skin after finding himself in crisis. It includes a decision to change behavior, a longing to be safe and secure, and the father figure's welcome and approval. It even includes, the, the parable of the shrewd manager even includes the figure of the elder brother at the end. The last few verses are actually moralizing by Luke. These are words that Luke added to the parable of Jesus. Scholars agree on that, that this is Luke moralizing, and that's um, equivalent to the older brother disapproving and missing the grace and mercy that God is offering to his lost brother. And those, those who would read this parable as a moral about money or stewardship or whatever are, and focusing only on that are also missing the element of redemption and grace that's in this parable. Reinhold Niebuhr reads the story as a story of grace as well but he tempers it with a bit of realism. While he acknowledges that the master's approval of the manager's shrewdness, or while he acknowledges the master's approval of the manager's shrewdness, 
he suggests that the manager's behavior is just an example of the ways in which self-interest coexists with noble behavior in our world in all sorts of ways all the time. And, and it, that it may even have a positive outcome. In other words, not every good deed is pure in motive or purely altruistic, but they may still have a good outcome. So nonetheless, while the manager's behavior is questionable, in the kingdom of God, the move towards rectifying his bad deeds, even if it's out of self-interest, is cause for celebration. The kingdom of God is funny that way. The unexpected also often happens. The topsy-turvy often happens. So what we have here is God celebrating a conniver who reforms just to save his skin. And haven't we also been happily skimming off more than our fair share of resources? Haven't we been overcharging the ecosystem and now we're being called into account for our management? We've reached a crisis point and now we're reforming to save our skins. In the parable, it's the landowner calling the manager to account, which we can interpret as God calling us to repent of our misdeeds. For us, in the context of our focus on the care of creation this month, it's God in the burning bush that's showing us signs in creation that are calling us to account. We've reached a crisis point, so we're scrambling to save our skins. We're at the crisis point of global warming resulting in climate change, and we're experiencing droughts and floods and fires and famine. And so what are we doing to try and save our skin? We're, one of the things that we're doing is planting trees for carbon offset. In, instead of continuing to skim the profits, we're trying to find ways that will restore uh, balance in the relationship um, and to, to try and bring about mutual benefit. Um, and the idea behind this is that the trees breathe out the oxygen that we breathe in and we breathe out the carbon dioxide that trees breathe in. So if we plant trees, they're able to sequester that carbon in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out and that contributes to the global warming and carbon that is produced into the atmosphere by many other sources, methane gas from cows, for example, or hog lagoons, all those kinds of things. Many, many uh, ways that we put carbon into the atmosphere, but the trees there are able to absorb that carbon and sequester it, keep it out of the air, and uh, kind of restore that balance. So these trees remind us of our interconnection and our interdependence. They remind us that we are bound as creatures of God's hand in a world of God's making, in a complex web of relationships with other creatures and elements of the created world. We have mismanaged those relationships in many ways, but God offers us redemption nonetheless. Like that shrewd manager, we are flawed people trying to do some good in a bad situation. And like the manager, we are wrong when we see God's people and creation primarily as useful to us for our own comfort and security, as a means to an end rather than ends in themselves, rather than as just good and worthy simply because God made them and called them good. Like the manager, even though we are flawed and our motives may not be entirely pure, everything that we can do to correct our mismanagement is a step in the right direction. We still need to repent and to drastically reduce our consumption in the first place. And we still need deeply changed hearts and minds that are willing to trust our safety and our security to God rather than to our own ability to manipulate things for our benefit and comfort. And this parable, as confusing as it is, 
encourages us in our struggles and it reminds us that we are entrusted to one another for the well-being of each other and of our common home. It reminds us that our salvation is in leaning towards relationships, in leaning towards interdependence in community instead of self-sufficiency. Our salvation is in considering others more than we consider ourselves, and it's in working for mutual flourishing. And just as the landowner celebrated the manager's resourcefulness, we can celebrate with God our increasing awareness of the preciousness and fragility of God's good creation and the redemption that is coming out of that increased awareness. And we can all give thanks to God for the mercy and the grace that God shows us along the way as we travel that path towards Christian perfection and redemption in God's kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to please stand in body or in spirit as we join together in our hymn of response, number 189. remain standing for the Apostles' Creed, which is found on number 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We are reminded of God's providence, God's unfailing mercies and provision for us um, every time that we give back to God the first fruits of our labors. So I invite the ushers to come forward now as we return to God, God's tithes and our offerings. Almighty God, you are gracious to us and you love us with all our flaws. Thank you for your forgiveness and the offer of redemption. In gratitude, we offer ourselves and these humble gifts for your service. Use us and use these tithes, not for our own self-preservation, but for the transformation of the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Now please remain standing for our sending hymn number 378.
brothers and sisters, we at any given point can be any of the characters in that parable. We can be dishonest managers, but God is a God of mercy and grace, and God can take our questionable deeds and make something good out of them. And for this, we give thanks to God. So go forth in peace with the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the companionship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>